Good morning, it's Pastor Ralph. Happy to be with you again. Let's get into a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for another opportunity. It is a privilege for us to get into your word. And now we invite your presence and we ask, Lord, that you would teach us things to make us better. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get right into it today. I am here to encourage you today. And I want to encourage you with what I've been studying this week. And I believe that it will be helpful to you uh, to learn about this new subject that I'm going to share with you today. And I'm going to be reading from the book of Romans, chapter 5. And uh, the subtitle is Results of Justification. Results of Justification. And the word justification is just a word that means that you have been declared something. In this case, you have been declared righteous. So the results of being declared righteous is what we're going to get into. And I know that it'll be a source of encouragement to you because when we feel unworthy or unrighteous, it has an effect on our behavior. And I want you to know today that we have been declared righteous according to scripture. So that's a mindset and it should bring a certain amount of awareness to you so that you don't have to try to do everything to feel righteous or to be righteous, that you are righteous. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about around the 21st verse that Christ became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. And so the Bible calls us ambassadors for Christ. And so it's important that we start out with that mindset so that you're not trying to be a do-gooder or do all these things to feel good. Sometimes people think, well, if I go to church, if I read my Bible, if I do acts of charity or donate or do this or that, that I'm going to be looked at as a righteous person. Well, no, righteousness and justification is a gift that was given to us because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So just like grace, you didn't do anything to earn grace and you can't earn it. It's unmerited favor. Justification is not something you could earn, but it was given to us by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you accept Christ, you're basically accepting grace. When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you're accepting righteousness. You're accepting sanctification. You're accepting justification. So it kind of goes like that. So I want you to know if you are a born again believer, if you have come to Christ and you have made uh, him your Lord and your Savior, if you have given your life to him and you choose to pick up your cross and walk after him and follow him, then you are justified by faith. Faith is what brings us everything from God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You'll find that over in Hebrews chapter 11 around the sixth verse. So it's important. So let's start here with justification and the results of it. And chapter five of Romans, starting with verse one, listen carefully as we read the scriptures. It's always the word of God that you have to pay attention to. It's not my spin on it. It's not my interpretation of it. It's about the context and what we read. So when you keep it in context, it kind of explains itself. You don't have to do too much trying to figure it all out. But let's go with this in verse one. Therefore, having been justified by faith, Right out the box, you're justified how? By faith. How are you justified by, by faith? How are you justified by faith? By placing your trust and your confidence in Jesus Christ. So therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have peace with God. What does that really mean when we have peace with God? Let me just say it to you this way. The wrath of God it's upon the children of disobedience. There is no arbitration. There is no mediator for them, but Jesus Christ himself. So when we accept Jesus Christ, we accept mediation. We accept advocacy. We accept someone who stands between us and God. Now, the reason God is not in wrath or enraged or angry with us anymore or our flesh or our sin is because all of the wrath of God has been placed on Jesus on the cross. So everything that Jesus experienced on the cross should have happened to you and should have happened to me. So the wrath of God comes upon sin, right? And we were born in sin and we were conceived in iniquity. So I'm loving the fact that he says, therefore, having been justified, in other words, declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God. No more wrath. We are now the children of God. And the wrath was placed on Jesus. And Jesus lived a life holy and separate unto God, the life we could not live 
Jesus lived it for us, and yet he was victorious. And the Bible says, and without sin. So I'm thankful to God that we're covered by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Now, listen, this is the real important part. Now, in verse two, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. So we couldn't even receive or access grace that God had provided for all of us, which grace is God's redemption for us, you know? And, and I always like to look at grace as, a, as an acronym. If you think about redemption, so grace is God's redemption at Christ's expense. That's the word grace, God's redemption at Christ's expense. So we have grace based on Jesus. This is why Jesus is so important to your personal relationship with God and why so many different other paradigms and mindsets and religions fight against the idea of who Jesus really is because he is the one that God has accepted as the supreme sacrifice for our sins so that we can be right with God. Remember Jesus said in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one or no man comes to the father except he come to me. Now, either Jesus made that up and he didn't tell the truth or Jesus is actually telling the truth. And I'm going to go with the latter part. Jesus is telling the truth. In fact, we know that because we found a couple of places in the Bible where the heavens opened up. One at John's baptism, at the baptism of Jesus. And God said and spoke in a loud voice when everybody heard it. This is my beloved son. In him, I'm well pleased. On another occasion, when they're on the Mount of Transfiguration and Jesus was transfigured in front of Peter, James, and John, he says, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. So we see in these cases that Jesus was approved by God the Father as the sacrifice or the representation of us before God. So therefore, what should have happened to us happened to Jesus. And now we get to receive the grace thereby. So that's good news, man. And so I want you to start thinking about you are a redeemed individual. You have a relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. And there is nothing that you can do more to make God love you any more than he already does, except have your faith and confidence in Jesus Christ, his son. When you do that, Everything belongs to you. Whatever G belonged to Jesus now belongs to us. And so that's the covenant relationship that we have. You might want to read John 17 because that, and that is what I call the Lord's prayer. I know we, we read Matthew uh, six and we talk about the Lord's prayer there. That's the prayer he taught the disciples, how he taught them how to pray. But John 17 is really the Lord's prayer. And when you read through that in context, you get an understanding of why Jesus did what he did and how much love the father had for Jesus. Now he has that same love for us, man. It's a wonderful prayer. So go to John 17 later on in your studies this week and read that. Now in verse two, again, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now listen, and we exult in hope. He says of the glory of God, we exult in hope of the glory of God. And I want to talk about hope because when we're talking about justification, the results of justification, the results of justification is the hope that we have. So when I look up the word hope, it says this, hope is a forward looking faith. When you have hope, you have faith that looks forward. All right. It is confident belief. Hope is future certainty that gives us joy. Now we bring this word joy in there because joy is about fulfillment. Joy is really not about happiness. It's about completion. It's about fulfillment. And see, when Jesus, for the joy of the cross, didn't despise his shame, he finished the work so that we could have life and that he, he resisted yet even unto blood so that he could be that sacrifice for us, you know, and it was appointed unto Jesus to come and to die for our sins and then to pass over the life that he gave to us so that we could have that same resurrection life that he had with the Father. So in the same way, when Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, we accept Jesus Christ. When we die and get buried, we shall rise again. I mean, that's an awesome thing. These are truths that you will experience. It's hard to understand them, but you will experience them one day. And so when we talk about this forward-looking faith, this confident belief, and then get the reality that hope is future certainty that gives us joy. Now we know that there is nothing certain in this world. Everything in this world is uncertain. But here, hope brings us a certain amount of certainty. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, he gives us a definition of faith. He says, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. See, so faith gives us hope. Faith and hope gives us a picture 
of what we can believe for. And if you're alive now and you're in Christ, you should be looking to the future. Again, Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow in a day to day kind of a way. But we should take thought for tomorrow in the sense of the future relationship that we have with God. I mean, if we didn't take thought for tomorrow, we wouldn't be thinking about heaven, would we? You see, because tomorrow or today when we die, we go to heaven and see. So we should always think futuristically. We should always think hope. We should think a little further than our present life and never look back in the past because the, the past is not hope. The past causes doubt unbelief and rebellion. And so we want to look towards the hope that God has given us. And through justification, we now can realize this hope. And what is this hope? Hope is future certainty that gives us joy. When I stop and think about my relationship with Jesus and how I'm encouraged that one day I'm going to see him and I'm going to be as he is, and I'm going to leave this world and enter into the next world. So when you, when you die in this world, when we pass on in this world, we exist to live in another realm. So we really don't die. This body dies, but our spirit and soul carries on. And so with this notion and understanding the scriptures, then I can rest assured with certainty and have joy looking to that day that when I stand before God and I can stand before God without fear and trembling because Jesus died for me. He rescued me from the world and my sin and all the condition that uh, we received from Adam. When Adam uh, sinned, he passed sin unto us. Therefore, Adam died, we would die. But now Jesus came and he uh, satisfied the demands for divine justice. And now he lived righteous. So when he died, he rose again in righteousness. When we die, when we accept Christ, we rise again in righteousness. We rise to uh, stand before God without condemnation. That's the good news. We stand before God justified. This is the result of justification. And the result of justification is our hope. So understand that. And so we can then look with anticipation and with an inner knowing that everything is well with us. And so no matter what you're going through every day, their hope tells you that everything is okay. You might be suffering with a sickness right now. You might be having pain in your life or some broken relationship or something may not be going your way. You might be struggling in life to have employment, whatever it is you're doing. If we have this joy and this hope that we are with God and God is with us, everything is temporary. Remember, it's the grace of God that's going to carry us through and God's not going to allow you to suffer long. We just need to hold on Trust him and learn how to endure. Now let's go on to the next verse here. Let's go to verse three. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations. Why is it that we can exalt in our tribulations? Why can't we elevate in our tribulations? Well, in, in James chapter one, around verse two, it says, count it all joy, brethren, when you entertain trials or become aware of the trials that you're going through, all the different troubles and things. So he says, count it joy, count it as joy. And the reason you can count it as joy, because the next verse said, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and endurance is just another way of saying patience. And a lot of people have a problem with patience because one of the things they like to say is God uh, help me and give me more patience. Well, if God gives you more patience, he has to give you more trials because trials is what makes you patient. If you learn learn to endure them. If you don't learn to endure them, you're going to keep getting trials. So you have to get to a place where you exercise your patience muscle and learn how to overcome things and not be so impatient. So it's important. So he says we can exalt in our tribulations. Why? Knowing that tribulation or trouble brings about perseverance. Perseverance is another way of talking about stick to itiveness. Uh, staying power, standing power, you know, outlasting uh, the things that we go through, enduring the trouble or the adversity that we face. I am persevering. And you need to say to yourself, I am a persevering individual. I can stand through my tribulation knowing that my tribulation is only going to produce more perseverance. And then what happens then? He says, this is so good. He says, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, right? And perseverance, proven character. I mean, how important is proven character? I mean, we all have character, 
but do we have proven character? I mean, some people are just a character, but if you have proven character, that means you are a person that can be depended upon, a person of integrity, a person of honesty, because when you have proven character, you can be trusted, you see? And so uh, friends have to have proven character for you to call them your best friend. Why would the term best become before friend? Because they've proven themselves to you and their character is different than other people. There's no such thing as three or four or five best friends. When you say that's my best friend, that's a place for one, right? There's not a place for two. You can't say these are all my besties. You know, at some point you only have a best friend. If that's the case, you shouldn't say best friend. You can just say my friend, but proving character is what we're after to make sure that we are authentic. Are you an authentic person? Can you be trusted? You know, can God trust you? Can people trust you? He says this brings about proven character. Now listen, and proven character brings about hope. So hope is the goal. That's what we're after. And what is hope again? Let me read it to you. A forward looking faith. Hope is the future certainty that God gives us joy. It is also confident belief. It is knowing that what God says will happen so we can anticipate an inner knowing and have a true confidence and faith that what God says is going to happen. That's hope. You know, hope is a picture. So when you see that picture and you envision that picture of what God says, and that's another thing, imagination and vis visualization is a part of understanding hope and the reality of hope. And so if you can get a picture in your mind, like Abraham did, God called him and said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Now he didn't know what that was like, because first of all, uh, his name was Abram. And at that point he didn't have any children. So he didn't have any generational seed. And so God promised him a son and you know the story. I'll keep it short. He ended up having an Ishmael, which that's not what God ordained him to do. He had it with his handmaiden Hagar, but God wanted him to have a child with Sarah. And so later on, he went back and obeyed God and Sarah and Abraham had a child. His name was Isaac. Well, through Isaac, he said, all the nations will be blessed. Well, the good news about Abraham, when God changed his name from Abram to Abraham by cutting the covenant with him, he became the friend of God. Abraham had to believe God. He had to get to a point where the Bible says in hope against hope, he believed God. And he was also fully persuaded that God was able to do what he said or what he promised. Are you fully persuaded in an area of your life of what you know the scripture says or what you've heard God speak to you? Are you fully persuaded that God is able to do what he says? And you can't go by the timing of it all. Sometimes when God doesn't move, when we want him to, we think God hasn't heard our prayer. But remember, this is bigger than us and it's about context and God has always answered the prayer. In fact, from the time you ask God something in faith, it's already done. Jesus said it in Mark 11, verse 24. He says, when you pray, he says, believe that you've received it and you shall have it. So you have to have the already uh, notion, the notion that you have emotional connection with what you've asked God for. You feel it, you experience it inside, you visualize it, you internalize it. He says, and you shall have it. And that's what it's all about. So you got to get to that place. That's what real belief is. You experience it through emotion and God will manifest the very thing that you ask according to his will. So that's so important too. So hope is what we're after. And then I love this in verse five. He says, and hope does not disappoint. In other words, in, in, in the Proverbs, he talks about hope deferred makes the heart sick. In other words, in layman's terms, when a person is hoping for something, and it doesn't happen when they think it should happen, you can kind of get sick or become doubtful or become resentful. So when he says hope deferred makes the heart sick, that's what he's talking about. But a tree of life, you know, is a desire fulfilled or desire fulfilled is a tree of life rather is what he's saying. A desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And so you want to get to a place where we know that if anything is disappointing us, it didn't come out of the realm of hope because hope is all about joy. Hope is all about God manifesting and God bringing to pass. Hope is always about confident belief. And see, so if it's disappointing to you, it's not hope. So you, you have to look and reframe the way you think about things and raise your level of awareness to where you understand that hope is future good. Everything that has to do with hope is good. Nothing that has to do with hope is bad. So you got to understand that. All right. 
Now, he says this in verse five again, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured or shed about in our hearts. He says through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So this is so important for us to understand. I want you to really understand this when I read it to you again. He says, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So you can't go around saying that you don't have any love in your heart because the Bible says God, who is love by the Holy Spirit, has poured himself into you. So you have love and you have the love of God. In fact, you have God on the inside of you. That's what's so important here. And the Holy Spirit, who was given to us, made certain that you had this love. So the moment you came into Christ, the moment you gave your life to Christ, there is a pouring of God's love on the inside of you to flood your soul. So we have that inside of us. Now watch this. This is so important. And we need to get it and to raise our understanding, our level of understanding of how much God loves us. This is so encouraging. If we understand that the result of, of justification is about hope and hope does not disappoint. And through any trial or tribulation, like he said here, and I'm going to read it again, not to be redundant, but it bears repeating. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations bring about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. And then he says, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within your hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, watch this. Here's the encouraging piece. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. I mean, you can imagine that for you to put your life on the line for somebody who's a good person. I mean, that's kind of a thing. You'd have to make a real good decision. You would hardly do that, you know, especially being a human being. But then he goes on to say, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare to even die. Now watch this, but God, and whenever you see, but God in the Bible, there's a few, but gods throughout the Bible. You might want to do a study of those, look it up in your concordance, go and Google it all the areas where the Bible says, but God, because every time he says, but God, that means some major benefit is about to happen to us and for us and through us. Listen, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. Now watch this in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now here's a powerful notion. Many people believe they have to be good enough for God to do something for them. Many people think they have to straighten up their act before God does something for them. I used to have friends of mine. I would say, hey man, come and hang out with church to go to church with me. Hang out. Man, if I go to church, the church is going to blow up. I, mean, I got to get my act together. This is the thing they would say. This is the notion that they have. They think that they have to be a good person before they have an interview with God or that God would even entertain their presence. Well, according to this scripture, listen, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, not while we were getting ourselves together, Christ died for us. Do you see that? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that means that while you were a sinner, the love of God was being made available to you through the preaching of the gospel, right? So we preach the gospel so that faith can come. Romans 10, 17 says it like that. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, because faith after being heard is giving you an opportunity to make a decision. And the decision you're going to make is to act on the word that you heard. Now, the Bible tells us over in, in James uh, chapter one, he says in verse 22, not to be just a hearer of the word, having heard it, but be a doer of the word. In other words, if you're going to hear what God says, in order for it to be a benefit to you, you must do what it says. And many people have heard it, but many people haven't acted upon it. And see, and so we got to get to a place where we receive by faith the benefit of hearing the gospel so that we can be installed with the love of God and therefore we can have proper hope and we can go you therefore into the world and we can help other people who have no idea that in their despair, 
God cares. In their disappointment, God brings encouragement. No matter what it is that they're experiencing, no matter what it is that they're doing, God is here for them. And so let me just read this one more time because I'm bringing this to a close. But God demonstrates, you know, when you talk about something that has been demonstrated, a lot of people who have a sales job, sometimes they're selling a product. A lot of times they like to enter into your home and they like to demonstrate to you how the vacuum cleaner works or how the food processor works, whatever it is they're selling. They like to break it down in front of you and demonstrate because they believe that the proof is in the doing. So if they show you, they can show you better than they can tell you. If I just say, oh, this is the best vacuum cleaner in the world. You're not going to really know unless you see what it does. So they throw dirt on your floor or shampoo or they'll throw stuff on your carpet and they'll hook that shampoo or that vacuum cleaner up and they'll show you a demonstration in front of you so that you know that you know that they can rule out all of your questions and answer all of your questions and take away all your objections and all of that. Well, God did the same thing, but God demonstrates his own love, not someone else's love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, he sent Christ to die for us. In other words, he asked us for nothing uh, to do what he did. In other words, God moved first. God acted first. God loved first. God gave us something to respond to and not react to, but something to respond to. So he gave us his love through his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that is encouraging. That's why I wanted to share this with you. I wanted to share with you the results of justification is our hope, our certainty in the things of God. We can always count on God and we can always trust what he says. And that's what I have for you today. I pray it was a blessing to you. And I want you to really receive this hope and this love of God that he's given to us in Jesus name. Amen.